I, I think that the conclusion of uh, the book that I brought after taking the difficult uh, path uh, would be to start uh, uh, from practice. So uh, instead of uh, uh, deep diving into theory, uh, start with the practice and specifically with the practice that takes into account uh, the human element. So glad you could join us. Um, welcome to this this uh, live stream, which is coming via the Kenevan community. Um, now we we were interested in interviewing you because you're working on a book called Living Complexity, uh, which, as far as we can tell, seems to be a way to gradually introduce people and then co-workers, teams, and organisations to complexity, which is obviously a very big topic that we're interested in here. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about where you come from and how you got interested in complexity? Hi Tom, yes that's uh, right, I'm working on this book about uh, a book titled Even Complexity and uh, I'm happy to share with you some of the thoughts coming from this book. About myself, uh, originally I'm a software developer and uh, my path to complexity uh, started in software development, actually, um, and uh, with the agile software development. So between 2001, 2002, I started to get to in, into agile software development and specifically into extreme programming. And after a few years, I started to notice some success uh, it was working well for me and for my team. Now, since I come from uh, uh, computer programming, I also studied computer science. And, you know, in math, there is historically these interesting things in mathematics. Uh, in the beginning, they started to study numbers, basic geometry, very tangible things. But then when they start to get to, into more theoretical and abstract thinking, Mathematicians start to wonder what are the foundations of mathematics? Is this holding on? Is this working? And so going back to me and uh, my journey in computer programming and agile, at some point I start to ask myself, why is this working? What are the foundations? Is this new age? Is this pseudoscience? Or now that I'm invest investing so many years of my professional life, are there solid foundation? And this is where I got into computer science, in a, a complexity, into complexity science, and later on in human complexity and anthro complexity. Okay, so it sounds like you're, you, you saw, a, you found a link between extreme programming and complexity. Yeah. To begin with, and then that extended into the anthro complexity side, the working with people. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I found a link between uh, extreme programming and agile in general uh, with complexity. Now, that was just the beginning of the journey. At that time, uh, uh, people start to introduce the idea of uh, complexity science, uh, uh, but many of the examples were about uh, cellula cellular automata, uh, BOIDs. So we are talking about algorithms the agents in the complex system were algorithms. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was a beginning of a journey because uh, people are very different. <laughs> and so the conclusion that you can, uh, that you come to when you look at system where the agents are algorithm or ants or animal, are not yeah. the same that you come to when uh, you look at human being. So that has been a, a starting point. Uh, and uh, through the journey, uh, I finally arrived to clarify the importance of the human element, human complexity and anthro complexity. And that's what uh, is really important for us and our work. 
I, I couldn't agree more, but uh, what I can hear there through the journey, I'm hearing that there were some, some setbacks and difficult times along the way, perhaps. Uh, are there any of those you could share? Anything that went wrong as you tried to introduce complexity? Yes, and I think it links back to, to my passion into computer programming and my background in computer science that, again, is a branch of math, mathematics. So I started with a scientific approach into computer science, in a, to complexity science, and uh, even when I start to apply uh, complexity science inside my team and with other people, I initially took a scientific approach. I started to explain the theory. And I got two types of reactions. On one side, uh, the majority of uh, people do not start with theory when they learn things. They were listening, tried to understand, but those things were too abstract. Yes, we computer programmers love abstractions, we live with those, but most of the people think in terms of tangible things. They start to learn with examples. They start to learn from practice. Most of the people, we start to learn starting with the small things and building on top of those. So my first setback was uh, uh, the difficulties of moving from theory to practice. And then I also found a sm smaller group of people that were also interested into the theory like me, but with them, the challenge was different. It was all ab about talking theory and never going into practice. So this is where I realized, okay, this complexity science thing is working great for me, is giving me an age. He allows me to understand what's going on. He helped me to make better decisions, but it's just about me. If I want to get this to the next level with the rest of the team and the organization, I need to take a different approach. And this is where I started to look into a more practical approach. Cool. What was the what was the first sort of practical nugget that really worked for you? Well, it started with a, a small crisis uh, inside uh, a team. Uh, we were uh, doing some uh, work uh, on uh, a large and legacy system. We were trying to autom automate some testing of this large system uh, and. Uh, it was extremely difficult. A lot of configuration file and stuff was spread all over the production system and no one had a clue about where those key parts of the system were spread all around and how to replicate those things in a, in a test environment, how to replicate uh, the 10 and 100 of external services uh, connected by the system. So yeah. I suspect that's familiar to anyone who's been working in software. Yeah, it's a, it's a typical situation. What was different is that we were a very small team with extremely smart and talented software engineers, extremely experienced in this. Apart from me, everyone else was like that. And at some point, we find ourselves arguing with each other about what to do because we were failing and failing again and failing again and thinking about, oh, let's just try harder and harder and harder. And then at that point, uh, I step back a second and I share with the others, look, look what's going on. We are all smart, but none of us agree on what to do. None of us is sure about what is the solution. Maybe this is a suggestion that there is something bigger going on. Maybe there is a degree of complexity. In that case, it was technical complexity connected with human complexity. But this was an example of stepping back, using some concept and idea uh, from complexity to explain, to use human emotion, team dynamic to introduce 
the seed of the idea that maybe it was the complexity that was making us fail and maybe we should have taken a different approach to that in order uh -huh. to find yes. this so i'm hearing this was a this was a chance when uh, people who are looking for specific examples where well, this was one they were living the example at this point and so you were able to introduce that story directly in the moment yeah exactly that that is one example let me make another example uh, this is a positive so that was not a reaction to a sudden uh, uh, challenge of the team but this is something that i started to do as part of a, a lean inception uh, lean inception is an agile practice that uh, we do sometimes at the beginning of a delivery initiative when we have to choose to commit for a big chunk of work at three or six months uh, and uh, the organization uh, from a budget point of view cannot uh, commit weekly they they have some uh, uh, necessity to, to commit uh, to a bigger chunk of work and so we do this kind of uh, release planning but in a very agile and light way and uh, what typically happen in the end when you look at this uh, uh, high level is you can call it estimation guesstimation of the app of the size of the effort uh, is that uh, people very often uh, underestimate uh, some of the challenges you know the complexity thinking around that uh, can we really estimate these uh, have we ever done this before have we ever worked this way before together and based on the answer, I encourage people to think about what is the type of approach that we should take in the investment, in the uh, way that we deliver this work, and which trust should we give in our estimation. So typically we will do a four point or three point method that we will do uh, we will use kinaving or do something very advanced to do this uh, that yeah. takes time but then I, I start to introduce something very simple like the ideas of uh, whoever done this before or uh, have we ever done this before and let's don't vote about these and then cool. that sounds like the uh, Liz Keogh's estimating complexity absolutely yeah. I realized that Liz and myself uh, uh, come uh, out uh, with the uh, two techniques that are that have many similarity so uh, let's actually she found an even simpler approach her approach is to ask who have ever done this before i come from computer science so even if i look for simplicity i even end up doing something a little less simple so i ask whoever done this before and uh, have we ever done this before together? So I, I look in, into technology, the domain, and then the people side. I ask people to dot vote. And then I say, look, if you are here, you can trust uh, uh, your estimate. You can use this approach. If you are there, mm, and if you are there, no way. You have to <laughs> use a completely different approach. And yes. So Leeds is exactly that type of thinking, uh, scale of complexity by Leeds. That's lovely. I, I like that you're considering as well the domain, the technology and the people as, as part of that, the, the different layers that you've got to, to work with. That sounds, that sounds smart. Um, I've been reading domain driven design, or starting to, and there's just, a, there's so much richness in the domain that gets missed so often. Uh, and it's a, such a source of complexity that is irreducible. You have to tackle the real world complexity that's there. Uh, but ideally, you don't create a lot of additional complexity with the choices that you make. Um, one thing I'm interested in is, is then, so, so you, you went through this exercise with the team. You're trying to set out a three to six month lean inception plan. And you've got now these three different buckets of, of work, which you need to estimate in different ways. What did the team then do to estimate those different buckets? Well, there is some lessons that I took from, uh, from complexity. This is a metaphor that I, I use often. Uh, I have nice mountains around my hometown. 
And I tell people, when you want to look at the mountains from all sides to get the full picture of the terrain and the landscape, you need to take a lot of picture from a lot of different points of view. And that's why when we do work like in lean inception, when we do estimation, we need to bring all the people together, starting with those that will do the work and also including the customers and the stakeholders. So I start to adopt a collective approach. This is one of the first learning from complexity and human complexity. We know that we don't know. We know that the information that we have individually is fragmented. We know that our understanding of the system is partial. And we know that when we bring everything together, things get messy. And so the first thing is to bring everything together to uh, facilitate uh, the uh, common understanding, uh, making sense of things together. And so I start to adopt that approach inspired by complexity already in the facilitation of the work. Great. Okay. So now you've got uh, the team and you're bringing in stakeholders, the customers as well, and everyone's perspective being brought in. I really like the, the metaphor of the mountains and getting a full picture of those. Um, and how did that go down? Because that yeah. usually makes makes a bit of a mess, as you said, it gets messy. Uh, then, you, but you've got to get through that mess or, or make sense of it somehow. Um, what what did you use for for that sort of approach? Well, um, there is one aspect that, that is the planning of the uh, the organization of the agenda of the leaning section, and you mentioned the mess. The mess is important as a team dynamic. Uh, uh, people at some point, the group have to surrender to that cause. But as a facilitator, uh, my role or the role of every facilitator is to help people see that there is a, a method in that cause. Uh, time to time, bring together the dots that all the group uh, connected and show them the picture that uh, the things that they are making sense of is diverging and then slowly converging. Slowly, uh, some coherence is emerging. And so uh, it's like bringing them through this journey of uh, letting, letting cows explode and then reassuring them that they are actually going through a journey and things start to slowly uh, converge. And so there are artifacts that are shared. We use uh, common artifacts like uh, epics and user story, for example, that are designed for a, a convergent type of thinking from gradual refinement, from conversations. They are designed to work uh, in, uh, in that way. Uh, when we estimate the size or uh, the effort of the work, we uh, amplify diversity of point of view. And actually, we point the length exactly where there are differences of opinion and disagreement, because this is where you will extract a lot of valuable information. And then uh, you find a way to uh, highlight and document unknown and uncertainty. And you live with that. You accept uncertainty unknowns and you document those because then that is part of a usable information. Smart people uh, find out uh, the answer to a lot of questions. Extremely smart people and extremely well informed people also accept that uh, they don't know something and that there is uncertainty. And my mm. work as facilitator is let that happen. That's it, and that's a there's a bit of an art to that as well, and feeling the 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 accept the acceptance of the group, I suppose, how how well the group is able to tolerate that level of uncertainty for for that long. Um, but it, it's triggered a, a reminder for me. There was a someone who replied to one of John Cutler's threads, who was talking about the way that they did this sort of planning and built in a buffer for uncertainty. And the, the idea was something like, if you're gonna add five story points, you had to add five points of buffer as well. And what you were looking to do was, was fill up your 
sort of estimated capacity, but where half of the space is buffer. And so then if your five point story goes over and becomes a 10 pointer, it turns out it was a nightmare. You cut a lot of that buffer away and then you have to find how can we recapture that buffer? You always have to keep that buffer there. So it was kind of an early warning system and a way of building in automatically that you have this tolerance for the uncertainty that's that's coming down the line. Um, have you tried that before? Is there anything else similar that you, you've used? Well, it remembers something similar, some similar thinking that I did in one of the practices that I use, as I mentioned, based on the level of complexity, um, I suggest uh, or one of the practices that I use suggests the different approaches to the estimate and also to a delivery initiative. So we are in software development. That's my main field. And I specify that because if I want to be practical, I need to specify the context. If I don't tell you what is the context, I need to be theoretical. So apologies yeah. if I go back to software development, but this is important. So, oh, yeah, no, the practical side is, is very important. And yeah, I mean, in software development, just to, to flesh out that context to everybody, I'm thinking what you've got is a, a, a team of people working on software. They're going to program things. They have to program the stuff that the business wants. And the question that they're always coming up against is, when will it be done? When can we have it? How can we go faster? That sort of thing. And the software has this thing uh, that is extremely powerful to automate things. Uh, but this also means that when you get something wrong with the estimate, uh, sometimes the buffer is not enough. Some mistakes in terms of estimates uh, create uh, uh, problems that are order of magnitude bigger than your initial estimates. Mm -hmm. So when I'm dealing with, the, when the team is dealing with the uh, challenges, delivery initiatives that are close to the uh, complicated uh, domain, the linear or ordered domain, uh, when they are in that space, a buffer can do, can do and is enough. When we are moving uh, close to the border between complicated and complex, uh, a buffer can only be a starting point. But the first suggestion to the approach to the investment and the delivery is use an iterative approach. Note that you don't know. So start with the buffer take a small chunk of the delivery initiative, invest in that a small chunk, start to do the work and be aware that your initial plan, plan will fail as soon as the battle start. But this is where you start to get extra information. This is where an experimental approach will lead to learning. This is where your initial estimate will be validated or will be improved. And this incremental approach works. This is kind of uh, uh, explaining why Scrum or extreme programming, why a sprint or iteration and an iterative approach connected to the human side of the team working works there. If mm -hmm. you are deep into the complexity or maybe at the boundary of chaos, well, even the iterative approach doesn't work. And of course, the buffer cannot work. There you need to go uh, full experimental and just start to probe things and uh, start to uh, search for some order and some partner, pa pa patterns. But be aware, you are just starting to explore. There is no time to make any plan for that. Mm, cool. So, yeah, I mean, this... It, the, I fully agree with all of that. And I, I really like the way that you illustrate how iteration works when you're in that liminal zone, complex to complicated. But uh, whereas if you're in complicated, well, waterfall is fine. You can make a plan, you can be pretty certain of it because you understand it all. And then there's a point where iteration doesn't even work anymore uh, when it gets too complex and closer to chaos. When you've got, though, say, stakeholders who they just want to plan and they want to know when it's going to be done, how did you find they took this, this approach? Was, did, did this work? Did they accept that this was the reality? Or did you have to play some other gymnastics to, to make it happen? 
Yeah, I, I use a practice that from a social point of view, I find it is effective. So, you know, I mentioned before the Lean Inception or this iterative way to work on a high level plan at the beginning. And I mentioned that uh, the customer and the stakeholder attended that session. That session is highly iterative. So when we come to share with the stakeholder the initial estimates, uh, this is where they realize, oh, it goes to, and it takes more than I thought. And this is where the real prioritization starts. But this is also when is the time to introduce exactly what you said, uh, to let them understand and accept uh, the level of uh, uncertainty. At that time of the planning, usually as a facilitator, I, I have established some credibility, bringing uh, the group through the journey of chaos uh, and uh, making uh, them able to create something that they think they will not be able to create, this beautiful plant coming out of a complete chaos. And then I use this practice. So from engineering, there is a this thing that is the cone of uncertainty. Uh, the scientific validity of the cone of uncertainty is not proved or in a sense is, has been disproved, but has this potential effect socially. So this is what I do. The cone of uncertainty applied to different degree of uh, uh, complexity tell you that if you are in a, in a complicated or a, order at the space, the level of uncertainty of the estimates is below 10, 15%. So a buffer will do. If you are in the middle and in that liminar space, complicated, complex, well, the, the estimation error can be 100 or 200%. And you know buffer don't do it anymore. You need to iterate. So I tell them your investment approach need to be something like this. You have to take a small chunk, invest on that, make sure you deliver something, go through all the steps and try things with the end customer and then reevaluate your investment. And I ask them, the risk is high. Do you think that the return on investment justify this level of risk or not? And then if uh, the delivery initiative is instead is deep into the complex, I tell them, look, the potential error in the estimates could go up to 400%. We just have to tell you that we know that we do not know nothing. Are you willing to invest money and time to buy uh, information, to do some experiment and get to understand a little more what we are doing and where we are going? And so these, uh, uh, using the visualization of the cone of uncertainty, using the narrative behind the cone of uncertainty and putting things in this way at that point, usually work with stakeholders when they realize that the mistakes and the uncertainty behind the estimation can be so big, they come to turn with that reality and they accept the things that uh, can be, okay, let's simplify things, let's prioritize things, let's adopt the approach that you are suggesting in order to deal with this uncertainty. It can go either way. Cool. Love it. Yeah, no, I think the, the, the bit that really clicks for me is just that realization that I suspect a lot of stakeholders think, sure, there's uncertainty in the estimations, but it is that sort of 10, 20 percent. You know, we can we can cope with that. But once you realize it's an order of magnitude, potentially or more, then it's yeah. it's just it, the game is is different fundamentally yeah. um, with this work. Then so uh, something from from my world is is really about understanding the unarticulated needs of the customers and figuring out the right thing to build rather than just building it the right way. Uh, and it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is, is very much related to that too. You need to evolve functionality with the customer when it's in that, that complex domain, rather than planning it out and expecting that people will do something that they'll do what you want them to do. No, no, they're going to do what they want to do. And you have to work with that somehow. 
were, were there any of the, have you got any examples of, of something where you started the iteration and it turned out, no, this isn't the right thing or we have to shift something fundamental and how did that go down? Well, um, I, yes, I, I have an example of, uh, of that in one case, uh, it happened exactly what I described it to you before and uh, uh, the stakeholders came to the realization that uh, the level of uncertainty and the complexity was too big, but they also came to the realization that the, what they were aiming to was uh, uh, too much and unnecessary. So they realized the impact of their uh, desire and their goals, and they changed the goal to fit the goal with the, the constraint that they were facing from, from the business. Other times, uh, uh, things uh, uh, got uh, uh, messy. And I have to tell you, it, it has been challenging because sometimes the culture in the organization is very focused uh, in a predictive uh, way. And so it's hard uh, to convince uh, uh, some people from the product side that, uh, you know, you have many ideas, but uh, the end customers is screaming to you that that's not what uh, uh, is going to work. And there is this tendency to say, I don't want to hear, let's go ahead, let's go ahead, let's have my product uh, uh, completed. So in those situations, what I do is uh, to try to connect the dot, uh, to bring uh, uh, the voice of the customers, to align things as much as possible as a, in a vertical way. So to make another metaphor, I like to slice the product and product increments in the same way that I slice a cake. And then I go back to the stakeholder and say, take a taste of, uh, of this slice of the cake. How does it taste? Instead of uh, thinking in terms of layer of the cake where you can test one layer, but you can say nothing about uh, the old cake. You really need the full vertical slice of it. So I try to connect the dot in that way. So the voice of the customers, the result of uh, uh, the first iteration become crystal clear to them. And we go from blindly pursuing an end goal to a cycle of continuous learning. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you, you have to fail before learning. That also sounds very familiar. Um, when you're thinking about how to slice the product information, product implementation that way, uh, what are there any tools or, or methods that you found are helpful for that? Well, uh, when I when I was uh, a lot into software development, uh, it's kind of an art. Uh, there are techniques. Uh, uh, techniques uh, that uh, you find from extreme programming and uh, you have uh, you have to learn that but that's just half of the work uh, you have to connect the uh, the art of slicing uh, the software development part with the art of slicing uh, the business product or user part and you have to do that to do a co-creation with your product and customer partners who created this slice together and see how can I make the technology challenges align with the product challenges and the user point of view in order to create a meaningful slice. So it's an act that I call of co-creation and co-evolution. You start with something that is wrong, but you co-evolve that idea until you come up with a meaningful slice that uh, do the job for you. That makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like that could be an entirely other conversation or several more into just that one part of it. Um, one thing I'm wondering then, so say um, I'm someone who's watching this and I'm in an organization, I've got a sense that complexity is hurting us and we're not tackling it properly. What are the signals that I might be seeing that would suggest the need for, for introducing some of the methods that you share in your book and uh, what what should I look for that can go wrong where, where can I start so um, 
so far we mentioned some of these uh, things at the team level or at the level of a single delivery initiative the estimates the failure of a sprint of an iteration a repeated failure uh, uh, argument a sense of disagreement and uncertainty toward the problem that instead they should simply be easy to tackle that's the team level but at organization level i use two different uh, tools uh, one i use uh, uh, a mapping of la loops cultural archetypes uh, with uh, agile again the complete scientific validity of uh, la loops cultural archetypes has been disputed but from a narrative point of view and from a rhetorical point of view that are extremely powerful. So I drive conversation toward the culture of the company and then I uh, create the mapping with the, the culture and the way of working that fit the company. Then I use the C2 uh, approach space where I analyze some element of the complexity of uh, the problem that the organization is facing, the market, the product, the technology. And I try to define the level of complexity. And so I, I also identify the level of agility that will benefit the, time of complex, the type of complexity that the company is facing. So you see, I have uh, uh, the challenge that the company is, is facing, the level of complexity that they are dealing with. I create awareness on that using the C2 space model. Based on that, I identify the level of agility that they need. And then from a cultural point of view, I tell them, this is where you are. This is the way of working that you can afford now, but this is what you would need in order to cope with everything that I told, I told you before. And so this is how I create awareness. And I, then I usually start the other conversations from there. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm here, the first thing was, was uh, Lalu, Frederick Lalu, his yeah. cultural architect idea. And the second one, I didn't quite catch, situ space, C2 space. Uh, C2 approach space, uh, Dr. Dr. Alberts uh, made a uh, research uh, uh, founded by the Department of uh, Defense and NATO about complexity in military endeavors, but also commercial endeavors. And they studied uh, uh, actually defined scientifically agility and how agility uh, need to be correlated to the degree of complexity of the challenges that you are facing. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, that, that sort of resonates with maybe Ashby's law of requisite variety. You need to have enough control mechanisms for the complexity of the, the space you're working with. Cool, that's interesting. Well, I think there's definitely plenty more reading and uh, resources that we can connect to, to this and, and go on. On that point, Tom, uh, if I could jump in. Uh, hi, Luca. Hi, John. Touched on a number of times learning, the importance of learning in complexity. Uh, and the overall theme of this series of conversations is lifelong learning and learning in the open. Uh, I think we know that grappling with uncertainty isn't dull. Uh, but at the same time, complexity shouldn't be considered too complex to learn. Uh, it's challenging, but at the same time, it's rewarding. Um, and given your background, I'm going to narrow narrow the focus of uh, this, this question and focus on engineers, which I always argue are good at dealing with complexity innately. But in 2021, where should an engineer start for a deeper dive into complexity and complex adaptive systems to start to apply complexity theory? Well, I, I think that the conclusion of uh, the book that I brought after taking the difficult uh, path uh, would be to start uh, uh, from practice. So uh, instead of uh, uh, deep diving into theory, uh, start with the practice and specifically with the practice that takes into account uh, the human element. Now, Software engineers play on both sides 
of the ordered and unordered system in the complicated and in the complex spaces challenges for us. Think about automation. All the automation happen in the complicated and simple or clear space, or this is where we push things when we can automate that. But then we are in the people side or in the innovative side of things. And this is where we are uh, in between complicated and complexity. And human element is fundamental. Uh, the way of thinking that we face in every organization and even at school is strongly influenced by a way of thinking that ignore complexity or try to apply complexity to mechanical system or at best to biological system or uh, insects. So I would say to every engineer, uh, start from the practice and uh, start uh, focusing on the human element. Great. And then, uh, so, so say I'm, I'm, I'm John, I'm a software engineer, and I want to start uh, applying this. What, what's the first sort of tool that, or, or approach that I might try? What am I, where, how am I going to go from, I'm waiting for requirements and designs to be made so that I can, I can program it up, to now stepping beyond that and bringing the humans in? So I identified two groups of, uh, of practices uh, in my book, Living Complexity. The first group is about self-organization. So as a team member in a software development team, how should I behave and collaborate with others? And what are the challenges that make it harder to do that? And in order to answer these questions, there are a set of practices related to self-organization. Now be aware, self-organization uh, as a term used in uh, agile, is not really self-organization as in computer size. But regardless of that, uh, you can start looking at the book, starting from the prerequisite of self-organization, starting to create awareness if they are there. Start to understand how and why you need to collaborate in a cross-functional way with other roles. Uh, what you have to do when you are dealing with a, a requirement or even better with the user story, why you should bring other uh, software engineers to discuss that topic with you. How you should focus uh, on those that disagree with you. How should you encourage a disagreement and uh, someone that challenges your idea or bring a different perspective? And this is just uh, an example about uh, self-organization. So start with the basic model from Joseph Perley. Then uh, uh, if we talk about estimates, another thing, uh, this is very relevant also for software developers. There are different companies that are working with different types of products, startups, or companies that are working on very mature and stable pro products. Each one of us tend to spend a lot of time of their professional life dealing with the class of problems that have a certain degree of complexity. And we tended to see all problems having that degree of complexity. So the first practice that I would suggest, start with some practice that assess the degree of complexity. Stacy, give you an idea of two human uh, experiences that can tell you that there may be some complexity there. So start there. That will be the second uh, suggestion. Become aware of the degree of complexity and that you have to adapt what you do based on the degree of complexity that you're facing. If I now shift focus to the current day thinking about complexity, the latest frameworks, what in your, your opinion should there be greater attention and focus on? Where, are, where is complexity sometimes failing? And if we, again, if we just focus on software engineering because uh, it's a relevant topic, um, what would you what would you put on the top of the list so a few things that are typical uh, typical mistakes that we software developers uh, uh, do and I, I did first again to dwell into theory too much 
jump into practice, starting with the small practices, first thing. Second challenge, especially for software developer, I told you we play on both sides of the ordered and unordered system. Uh, sometimes technology, some element of technology is all in the ordered system, but then the technology people side goes completely in the other side. So be aware that you are always working with two types of system, ordered and unordered. The third element, again, we software developers uh, can be fascinated about the voids, cellular automata, uh, systems and things that we can control. Uh, be aware of the human element. And uh, I, I was working on uh, identifying and describing the key ingredient of a human agent when I got in contact with the three I of uh, anthrocomplexity from Dave Snowden. And that blew my mind. I say, oh, all the things that I'm finding, they fit perfectly in those three I. Identity, we are unique and heterogeneous. You cannot aggregate us as human beings. We are not robots that execute things. Intentionality, each one of us has free agency, uh, as a free will agency, autonomy, spontaneity. You cannot control human being, but you can try to make a good use of their creativity and their drive. And then intelligence, uh, our social intelligence and also our ability to create a new knowledge and share your knowledge. So start there, everyone that you try to apply a complexity framework, ask yourself, are these human elements considered in that framework? If not, you are using the wrong framework. I like the last point that you made, um, but I'd just like to explore this a bit further because I think that's being framed around software development, the chaos and complexity that can emerge from that. But uh, an area that I work in and I'm interested in is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, where we're creating models which are often incredibly difficult to debug, but they are, can have a huge impact on society. Uh, so the question I have, which follows on from my last one, is looking at anthrocomplexity and socio-technical systems, such as machine learning models, which can be biased, etc. Where would a software engineer or a data scientist start to focus on complexity in order to understand it and then apply it to prevent those issues arising? Hmm. I, 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 I know it's a, a wide ranging question, but if you've got any kind of uh, thoughts. Well, the reflection that I had on that topic is that machine learning and artificial intelligence are uh, moving into that space that is in between what machines can do and what it means being human. They are invading that space and they are pushing us to think uh, deeper about what is uniquely human, what is our nature. And that is fascinating. And that is one of the work that I try to do a thinking process that I try to put in place when I start to think what makes a, a human agent in a complex system different from other type of agents. And uh, what came to my mind initially is uh, our social uh, intelligence, our ability to deal with the emotion and our ability to deal with the chaos. There are something related to emotion, something related to the social connection that we build, something related to our social intelligence that is uniquely human. And the mechanism that we use uh, uh, that are naturally complex, and I will tell you 
very soon uh, an interesting example are built around two mechanisms that is co-creation we co-create the new knowledge as a process of inter social interaction and co-evolution well co-evolution alone machine learning can do that but it is that co-creation of new knowledge sharing knowledge and the putting the social element the human element and human emotion into the process this is what is uniquely human and let me make this example we deal with complexity every day emotions that we deal with are, are complex how many times have you heard people talk about mixed emotion and they are paradoxical. Sometimes you love someone and sometimes you hate someone. And a dualistic approach to emotion doesn't work. You need to embrace the paradox of those emotions, to embrace the, all of it. And then only when you do that, you can have a, make a good decision about how to do with that. So as a human, we are built to deal with the complexity. It is a scientific thinking that pushes away from it. And the, some organizations do that. But when we are human, we are embedded. Uh, we have an embedded way of dealing with uh, that complexity. Fascinating. That reminds me of, I think, um, Sonia Blignor makes the point that humans are already naturally good at complexity. We, we can deal with it it's a lot of the structures in organizations that get in the way of that. And if we can let go of that and just be human, then it works. And the idea of using paradox also reminds me of that. That's something from uh, Dave Snowden's apparatic turn idea. And a paradox is a place where you can't resolve something and it forces you to, to look at the problem differently and to ask different questions. Um, yes, and I think this is an area where um, artificial intelligence and machine learning are uh, not there yet that is something that is uniquely human and john going back to your question given that is uniquely human it's our responsibility as human to be aware of of uh, that space the implication and then to use machine learning in a way that fulfill our humanity, our value, our ethics, because machine learning and artificial intelligence alone will not be able to uh, take the right decision, but it's our ethical obligation to do that. Fantastic. Well, it feels like we've gone on a full journey from the, the minutiae of how to get started with, uh, with yourself and understand what sort of complex environment you're working in to the grand scale of the effect of machine learning on society. And uh, I can't think of a better place to wrap up. So thank you very much, Luca, for your time and, and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, we'll obviously add a link to your book. Is it published yet or is it on the way? It is published on LeanPub, uh, still uh, in refinement, but almost done. Almost done. <laughs> Are things ever really done? Um, so we'll, we'll put a link to that and to some of the other resources that you mentioned in this chat. Um, but uh, all that remains to say is thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. Bye.